Okay, now it goes without saying, I think, that this portion of Scripture that I've just read to you just now, that this is a portion of Scripture that primarily has Christians in view. You can see that. I think that's an obvious thing to say. The book of Numbers is not only written about, but it is written to the covenant community. So this is a book, a section of Scripture where God addresses you, His people. That said, what I want to do this morning right now is actually to begin this sermon speaking to those who do not fall into that category. And I want to begin this sermon speaking to you in here if you are not a professing Christian. So that perhaps is people in this room who regard themselves as culturally Christian. Is that you? You regard yourself as culturally Christian, but you are not born again of the Holy Spirit of God and have this personal saving relationship with Christ. If that is you, then allow me to speak to you this morning and allow me to ask you this question. If you're not a Christian, today are you troubled by your sin? Let me be even more precise than that. I think about your life and your situation, and even though you're not a Christian, could it be said of you that you are weighed down by specific wrong that you have done, instances of sin, wrong that you have committed in your life, maybe immorality, deceit, dishonesty? Could it be said of you that you are troubled by your sin. Well, if you're not a Christian and you fall into that camp and that category of someone troubled by your sin, I want to say that today could be just the most marvelous and exciting and incredible day of your life. This could be a life-changing day for you. This could be an eternity-defining day for you. Okay, now, why can I say that? Well, this morning in Numbers chapter 5, you may have noticed what we're doing. We're looking at what Scripture calls sins of breaking faith with God. So what's that? Well, these sins were sins where people in Israel not only sinned deliberately against their neighbor. So stuff like fraud, theft, dishonesty. So it's not only that, but what they would go on to do is lie about it. That's what we're talking about, sins with breaking faith with God. So they sin against their neighbor, but then they go and swear on oath that they didn't do that. They actually swear on God's name. You see, breaking faith with God. And what's going to happen this morning? Well, God here in Numbers 5, he shows Israel how they can be forgiven even for those atrocities. Isn't that marvelous if you're not a Christian? Do you understand what's going to happen in here? As you come into this church, God here is going to show you how you can have removed from you eternally those sins that trouble you. That guilt that plagues your conscience. We'll see here about forgiveness for sin. So you know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to say to you? Please turn with me to Numbers 5. If you do not already have this portion of Scripture open in front of you, then please get to it either on your phone or on a copy of uh, the Scriptures that we've got in the church. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 5, from verse 5, and let's think firstly about this, that for full restoration, there must be sacrifice. That's the first thing that we learn here, that for restoration, there must be a sacrifice. Okay, we are a very multicultural bunch, a London City Presbyterian Church. So if you are not from this country, you may not know this. But in the United Kingdom, we have this whole genre of jokes that exist, it would appear, for the sole purpose of making fun of Irish people. Okay, so that's true, isn't it? If you're from the United Kingdom, there are all of these, there was an Englishman, a Scotsman, and an Irishman type jokes that exist, it would seem, to portray Irish people as either kind of backwards or daft. Now, I have always thought that that is a most unfair generalization, okay? So I want to hear just now act in solidarity with my Irish friends, because this is what I want us to do, okay? Yes, we are taught about forgiveness in this portion of Scripture, but being a Scotsman, not an Irishman, what I want to do is work 
backwards through this text. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I want to start at the end of this portion of Scripture, and I want to work up the way through the text, okay? So this is where I want you to go. I want you to go to the end of verse 8 with me. Let's go to the culmination of this section. Look at the end of verse 8. You found it? You got it? So God explains, up to this point, he's explained steps towards forgiveness, restitution. But what does he say now? He says that all of that stuff has to happen. And then he says, in addition to, and he says, it specifies a ram, and it's the ram of atonement. So is everyone with me at this point? Anything towards restoration here has to be built on the foundation of sacrifice. Sacrifice is critical. Now, I am not trying to patronize anyone in the room at this point, okay? And I'm not trying to be cheeky in any way, shape, or form. But is it fair to say that when we talk about the Old Testament sacrificial system, that the whole thing can seem a little bit blurry to us? I'm not trying to patronize or be cheeky. Is that fair enough that the whole Old Testament sacrificial system is so complicated it can seem a little bit fuzzy, can it? Like, we think like this, don't we? We know there were a lot of sacrifices in the sacrificial system. We know that they were for sin, don't we? We know that those sacrifices existed to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, but there it's where it stops, right? And the rest of it, the whole sacrificial system does. Maybe it's just me, but does it not? The whole sacrificial system seem a little bit blurry, seem a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, am I right or not? Yeah, there's a lot of nodding heads. Okay, let's try and add some uh, clarity to this. Listen to me at this point. At the book of Leviticus, there are listed for us five sacrifices, okay? Now, three in particular existed to teach the people about sin, Three main sacrifices that existed to teach people about the consequences, the effects of sin. So what do you say back to me? Okay, what were those three main sacrifices? Well, what I've done is I've given the children a worksheet this morning that has blanks to fill in. So boys and girls, you might want to look at those blanks at the moment. You can see why I've done it. If we're dealing with a sacrificial system and it's complicated, we want to take the kids, don't we? We want to take the kids with us on this. So you ready for the first one, boys and girls, with a blank? So in Leviticus, we learn first of all about burnt offerings. And the rest of us, we know this, right, don't we? We've heard of burnt offerings before, have we? What's involved there? Listen to me carefully, please. So a burnt offering was where the whole of an animal was taken and offered to God. The whole of an animal was placed on the altar, okay, and used in a sacrifice. Now, the purpose of this, I think, was in, indeed twofold in the burnt offering. Part of the reason was to offer up to God sweet-smelling aroma and fragrance to God. Do you see what God was doing? He was teaching the people that sacrifice for sin was pleasing to him, right? So that's part of the burnt offering, yeah? The other side of the burnt offering was to show the people of Israel just how serious sin was. And you can get it, can you? Like, think about it. This sacrifice that is replacing the person, substituting for the person, what happens in the burnt offering? It is consumed by flames. Like the sacrifice is entirely burnt up and consumed. Do you see what God is doing? God is showing sin is serious, not a trifling matter. It's a serious business. So that's the first one. Boys and girls, listen to your minister. Ready for the second blank space? This is easier, spelling-wise at least. Second one in Leviticus was the sin offering, or for the rest of us, if you want, purification offering in Leviticus. Now, what was the deal with this? Please, again, listen. So the second sacrifice, the purification, sin offering, was different to the first. So in the sin offering, it was only part of the animal that had to be offered and put on the altar. The other part was consumed outside of the camp. And here in the sin offering, listen to me, the focus was on the blood of the animal. 
And in particular, what had to happen in the purification offering was that sin was taken inside the tabernacle, and it's, it, sorry, blood was taken inside the tabernacle, and it was used to cleanse the holy items. In particular, get this, what had to happen was that the blood was sprinkled in the most holy place seven times. I wonder if you were asked, could you get the theme of the sinner, the purification offering? Do you get it? Where the burnt offering showed the seriousness of sin, the sin offering, purification, it showed that sin defiles us, that sin defiles all of humanity, that the only way that we could be cleansed by God is if what happened? What happened? Only way we could be disinfected was through blood. So you're with me thus far. I know it's heavy going. First thing, Sunday morning, right? First thing, Sunday morning, we've got the burnt offering and we've got the sin offering. All of that is to get to this point. So if you've been zoning out and thinking about your lunch or the football results from yesterday, you come back to me here because this is the third sacrifice in Leviticus. This is the critical. And listen to me, boys and girls, especially the third one was what is called the guilt offering. And maybe you want to think about it in terms of reparation. Why? What, what happened here? You must understand that in the guilt offering, God was very, very specific that a ram was used for sacrifice. It's an expensive ram. A flawless ram had to be used in the guilt offering. And friends, maybe you even from that see what the guilt offering was about. It existed to teach the people about debt that sin incurs a debt with God. That if people are to be forgiven, then God has to be compensated. You understand that God has to receive payment. And maybe right at this moment in this church, you now see why I'm saying to you that the third one, this guilt offering, is so critical for our understanding this morning. Do you see why? Because in Numbers chapter 5, it was the ram of atonement. In Numbers chapter 5, it is a guilt offering that is in view. If the deliberate sins of the people were to be forgiven, these sins of breaking faith with God, what had to occur? What had to be made? Is it just a sacrifice? No! God had to receive payment. You see it, don't you? God had to receive compensation. We owe God, the people owed God, a debt for these sins. Let me pause. Let me deal with the obvious common accusation against the sermon series, especially from those maybe who are visiting the church this morning. I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to think right now. You're going to think, what is the point in all of what you've just said? Because it's old covenant worship, isn't it? Like all these sacrifices in Israel, none, you know, like we do, how many people took a flawless ram to church this morning? This is old covenant worship, right? And you're saying, or some of you at least, they're saying, we're new covenant people. We don't have to worry about this. This is not what we do. And, and then the rest of you maybe know how I'm going to answer that. Maybe you think you know how I would answer that accusation. I want you to listen really carefully. Yes, we know that on that cross at Calvary, Christ Jesus offered for his people what? Uh, once and for all sacrifice for sin. We rejoice in that, do we not? Once and for all sacrifice. But is this not true? That now you and I have broken up the sacrificial system? Does it not add new depths of understanding and gratitude to Christ Jesus for what he has done for us in his atoning work? You understand where I'm going, do you? I mean, what happened at the cross? Was it just an ill-defined, vague sacrifice? Some sacrifice for sin? Is, is that it? Do you see that all of these elements, they are all fulfilled at Calvary? Friends, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? That first of all, what has Christ done? Christ Jesus has perfectly fulfilled the whole system of burnt offerings. That at Calvary to God was a burnt offering. What does Ephesians chapter 5 say? That that sacrifice at Calvary offers up to God fragrance, sweet smell, and aroma. You understand, Calvary was a burnt offering for God. But more, even more special, 
What's the cross? Christ Jesus there has also perfectly fulfilled the full system of purification and sin offerings. Because what does Hebrews chapter 10 say that Christ has done for us? Do you know what he's done by the cross? He is sprinkled. He sprinkled your hearts clean. Do you see what I'm saying to you? Christ Jesus fulfilling both the burnt offerings and the sin offerings. But we today in here, we're worried, aren't we? We're today we're concerned for those deliberate sins, those sins of breaking faith with God. Is there anything that Christ has done? God is owed compensation. He has owned a debt. Has Christ done anything for us? And then you remember our first reading in Isaiah chapter 53. Did you get it in Isaiah 53? Did you pick up what we are told? In Isaiah 53 verse 10, we are told it was the Lord's will to crush the Lord Jesus Christ, to crush the suffering servant, as there on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ made for us a guilt offering, that he made reparation for our sin. And if you are not a believer in this room, I wonder if you see what that means that Christ has made the once and for all guilt offering. It means that that sin on your shoulders need not be there. It means that this wickedness, this shame, this condemnation that follows you around and and affects and plagues your conscience, it need not follow you around. If you will just come to Christ, there is forgiveness for you. And how? Because he's paid the debt. Do you understand? That in his painstaking, wrath-taking death and calvary, what has Jesus Christ done for his people? He has already made compensation. Christ Jesus has already paid the payment. We owe God. He has paid the debt. So we see, first of all, there must be, for restoration, there must be sacrifice. Second of all, we see that there, for restoration, there must, or there ought to be, rather, there ought to be restitution. There ought to be restitution. So you're with me thus far, I hope. We've seen that forgiveness, there must be sacrifice. That is the foundation. I was going to say as we move on in the text, but no, that's not quite technically true, is it? As we move up the text and backwards through the text, we find another crucial detail, and it's this, that if God has to be compensated in sin, do you notice that the person that is sinned against ought also to be paid back? Did you notice that in verse 7? And it's very specific, isn't it? That the person we sin against, or the person that the, uh, the neighbor who has sinned against, they ought to, God says, they ought to uh, full restitution for his wrong, adding to it a fifth. Very specific, isn't it? It's like 20% extra has to be made. At this point, a question kind of arises in my mind, and maybe it arises in your mind as well. The question that I would ask God as I read Numbers chapter 5 is, God, why do you record these laws about restitution here in Numbers? Like maybe if you know your Bible really well, you know why we would ask that question. Why would we ask that question? Because God in the book of Leviticus God has already spelled out the laws of restitution. Do you hear that? Like in the book of Leviticus, in Leviticus 6, you could argue actually that God has already written these laws of restitution out in much greater detail than he does here. So do you see what I'm asking? I'm asking, well, God, why do you record them again? And then further, if you're going to record these laws of restitution again, why would you do it here? Like why at the beginning of the book of Numbers? Do you see the question at least? Like, I think there's, there's probably a couple of answers to that. First of all, what God is doing is addressing a previously ignored scenario. So I would ask you all to look with me to verse 8 for the previously unaddressed situation. Do you see it in verse 8? 
So this is new information. So it's, a lot of this stuff is in Leviticus. This is a new bit that's not in Leviticus. Do you see the situation? Like, so if uh, somebody sins against their neighbor, a little bit of time goes on, and that person feels guilty about it, but, oh, no, the person I've sinned against has died. The question rises, well, what do we do? Do we still have to make restitution? And the answer for Israel is, you do. You still have to make restitution. You've got to give money to the priests in the temple. So I think that's part of the reason that God records it here. Everyone following this? That he is dealing with a situation that wasn't recorded in Leviticus. That's one reason. There's another reason. For this, I would love to know from you, actually. Don't shout it out, but I would love to know if you've ever been in this predicament or situation. Have you ever gone on a family holiday? But have you ever gone on a family holiday with another family in tow? Have you ever been in that uh, circumstances? You see it, do you? Like two families, our best of friends, they decide to go off and holiday together. Have you ever done that? Ever, those situations are notoriously difficult, aren't they? Like uh, in my life, I don't know how many instances I've heard of two families who are best of friends beforehand, and then they go away on a trip or a holiday together, and by the end of the holiday, they are ready to tear each other apart, you know? They were best friends, they go away, and they're just ready to kill them. Okay, now why is that, do you think? I'm not, I'm not losing the plot. Stick with me. Like, why, why is that? Like, part of the reason is that when you're on holiday, you're living in each other's pockets. You're in everyone's face all the time, and that builds tension, doesn't it? Isn't that right? The other side of it is the travel. Are you with me that just traveling and journeying with people can be stressful? Like tensions emerge that haven't previously emerged. Isn't that right? Like, do you see that that's the sort of thing that we're dealing with here? Do you? Like think about the context at the start of Numbers. If you've been here at the sermon series, you know absolutely the context. What are these people about to do? They are about to journey together to the promised land to take a trip. And think about it. They're in these close proximity, these close quarters and all these tents, and they're going to be traveling together with all the stress. Do you see the answer to the question? What's the question? God, why do you record these laws here? Do you see what God is doing? He is ensuring peace for Israel. You understand it? This community is about to go to war. This community is about to invade pagan lands. If there is any infighting in Israel, do you see if they're feuding over money, if there's any bitterness, this could prove fatal. So what does God do? He restates his laws of restitution to make peace. He says to Israel, there must be harmony in the camp. There must be unity in the camp. You must make amends. Now, again, let me address the age-old accusation you're going to fire at us. You're going to say this is part of the civil law of Israel, that you and I this morning are not bound by God's Word to make full restitution and add to it a fifth, are you? This is for the Old Testament people. Why on earth would we study this? Can I give you the answer? It's because this morning for you at London City Presbyterian Church and for me, the same principle in Numbers 5, it still applies. I'll be more specific to you. Friend, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus this morning and you have wronged another, then today God wants you. He desires that you seek reconciliation and you seek to make amends. Maybe you would come back to me and say, how can you be so bold? How can you speak with such certainty and confidence there? Well, think about the New Testament witness. What does God do for his new covenant people in these matters? Does God not give you an example of restitution? We, from the youngest in here to the oldest, know the story of Zacchaeus. Do we not? We all know about Zacchaeus, don't we? Our little tax-collecting friend. What happens in the story of Zacchaeus? He sees and understands what Christ Jesus has done, the recompense that Christ is going to make for him. And what does Zacchaeus do? He makes amends. He makes full restitution. In fact, he adds fourfold what he has stolen. You see, God gives you an example. 
but does God not also explicitly command you to make amends? What does Matthew 5 tell us? We looked at it not long ago. Even if today we come to worship and we remember that our brother has something against us, what are we commanded to do? We are to commanded to leave the altar first, go, be reconciled to that person, and then come back to worship. You see, it's not just old covenant worship, friends. This principle still applies. God wants us to make amends. So let me ask you, make you feel uncomfortable perhaps, but I have to ask, has there been a relationship recently that is broken because in your heart of hearts you know that you have done wrong? Is there guilt in these matters and you have sinned against another? Is that applicable to you? Then I would urge you, urge you to consider the situation of London City Presbyterian Church. Do you see the parallel? We, like this community, are on this journey to the promised land, and we, in the next weeks and months and years, are going to have spiritual battles to fight. You see the lesson, there needs to be propriety in here. We need to be a people who seek harmony and unity, and I would urge you, if you are in this situation, to go make amends and seek to be reconciled to those you have wronged. So we see for restoration that there must be sacrifice. We see that there ought to be restitution. And then lastly, thirdly, finally, we see that there needs to be a confession. Our assistant minister, a chap called Harrison Perkins, if you're visiting, is from Alabama, in the deep south. And he is away for the weekend, but I'm going to try and cha- uh, channel uh, my American brother this morning and ask you whether you are tracking with me. That is the most American expression I've, I can think of. Eh? Are you tracking with me? So are, are you, do we see what's going on here? Do we see that forgiveness is put forward for even the most fierce sin? And then we're seeing that if we are a forgiven Christian, that we are still to act to make amends. But we are not just quite there not quite finished, because I do think there is this error that you and I could make when we are thinking about the Old Testament sacrificial system. I wonder if you fall into this error ever. Listen, we could think that it was all about this sacrifice. You see? We could think that that, that forgiveness in the Old Testament, and under this old Levitical code, was simply a mechanical thing where if somebody offers up the sacrifice, they will be cleansed, they will be forgiven. We could think of it in those terms. And I desperately want you to see that it wasn't quite as simple as that. So I would ask you, as we close with these things, to look at verse 7 with me, please. Look at verse 7. You might notice, actually, at the end of verse 6, did you see that there's tears, there's regret, there is realization? Do you see that at the end of verse 6? And then what has to happen? Do you notice that in order for the worshiper to actually partake in the benefits that the sacrifice provides, what does the worshiper have to do? Do you notice? The worshiper has to, con- this is new, this is not in Leviticus. The, the worshiper has to confess. You see the idea, do you? It's not just a mechanical thing, is it? There has to be repentance here to partake in the blessings of the sacrifice. There has to be repentance. There has to be confession. The person in the Old Testament has to confess the sin to the person he is wrong, but what else does he have to do? He has to confess his sin to to God, usually in the Old Testament with the hands upon the animal to be sacrificed, confessing the sins over the top of the animal. There has to be repentance, friend. There had to be confession of sin. Now, as I draw all of this to an end, and as we close, what could we do, do you think? What could we do just now? We could surely apply that to the people of God and to the Christians that are in this room. Because I hope and pray, if you're a Christian, you understand, do you not, that repentance and confession are not just critical to you coming to faith in Jesus, but they are to be part of your everyday life. You understand that, do you? You see it? Thomas Brooks, he once said this. He said that confession, repentance, ought to be for the Christian a continual spring ever flowing. 
Do you see it? Is to be part of our daily work confessing our sin, that we are to confess our sin, wait for it, to each other. James chapter 5. We're to confess our sin, obviously to the person who is wrong, but what are we taught? How are we taught to pray? We're to be confessing our sin to God. Christ teaches us, pray, forgive us, oh God. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Friends, we could close speaking to the Christians in here. Do you know what I want to do instead? I want to end where we've begun. I want to speak to you, that person in here who is not a Christian, who is not born again, but who is troubled by your sin. If that's you, listen to me, we close with us. You maybe remember what I said right at the start of this sermon, if that's you. Do you remember what I said? I said that today could be a really exciting day in your life. If you're troubled by sin, battling your conscience because of your wrongdoing, today could be an amazing day, a truly life-changing day. Maybe since I've said that to this point, you'd be wondering, well, how can today be so good? Do you know what it's about? It's just about this phrase I'm about to quote. And it The phrase shows you that this open door of forgiveness in Numbers 5, it stands open in front of you today. And will you listen to the phrase? Because it can change your life. This is a promise from God. We read this in 1 John 1 verse 9. God says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I say it again to you. You're not a Christian in here battling your sin weighed down by your transgression, maybe even your deliberate transgression. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I wonder, I wonder if you see the good news. Listen, there has already been made a full and perfect sacrifice for sin. Christ Jesus on that cross has already paid debt. He's already made full payment for his people's sins. If you will only today confess your sin, repent, come to Jesus Christ, you can partake in those blessings of cleansing and forgiveness that Christ and he alone has won. I'm really asking you, in light of such simplicity in the gospel, what would stop you? I mean, what are you waiting for? Today, come to Christ and enjoy the eternal forgiveness, the eternal cleansing that comes only through Jesus and his once and for all compensation, his once and for all sacrifice for sin. Friends, let's bow together and Praise our God. Lord, we do thank you for the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. We thank you that there was a burnt offering. We thank you that there was a sin offering. We thank you that there was the guilt offering. But we thank you much more for what these things pointed to, that each element was fulfilled at Calvary, that there we see a burnt offering that there we see purification, that there we see compensation to you, O God, has been made in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate prayer, Lord God, is that you would, for your own glory, save people even in this room today and open eyes that they might behold the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all for your name's sake. Amen.